Let's start out by seeing a show of hands. How many people here are already familiar with Git? <laughs> Somewhat familiar? Oh. Somewhat. Okay. Basically, you know what it is, but <laughs> yeah. I've used it all. Okay. I, okay. I've okay. used That's... it. I can get around with it and start, start doing branching okay. and merging. So, how stuff. many people have used Git regularly? Okay. So, how. Part of this is, um, part of it is tutorial, and I could, if everybody in the room was really familiar, I'll, I would tend to skip that, but it sounds to me like it's, it's worth going through that. Um, and, and sorry for those who are all, I know some of the people here are deep, deeply knowledgeable about Git, and some of this would be pretty boring to them, but I need them badly to answer questions, because I'm not a Git expert. Uh, I've used it. It has become my preferred version control system. I've used it for as my preferred system for probably about a year and a half. Okay. I'm expecting John Wigley to come in, and he's definitely more a Git expert than I am. Mm -hmm. He understands the internals and mm -hmm. stuff. So, um, he was anyway, so that okay. I, Please do ask questions. Feel free to interrupt at any time. What did you just say? <laughs> uh, when I'm presenting, I, get, I tend to sometimes get fairly wound up and get charging along and just interrupt. Um, the motivation for this session is that we really, this is an end, there's nothing theoretical about this. The, 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 the motivation for this is I just, Yesterday, I started realizing that this is what we better call Boost 2.0 because it's it's the beginning. It's the first step in a process of change that, when when it finally is finished, completely changes the way that we organize get software the way we deliver it and install it to users. And that, that's a big enough change we can call that one that was 2.0. Um, so with this, this is the deal is to inform you about Git and modularization. Uh, it's really as much concerned with modular, modularization as, as Git, uh, although we just start in the modularization, more of that comes later. Um, and to run up, I will uh, close the session with a straw poll to see who's, because I, I'm hoping even you, even anybody who knows almost nothing about this will be forming some opinions during this, and, and therefore their vote becomes interesting and valid in this little straw poll. Um, here's what we'll cover. We'll cover the big picture of why we're interested in changing. We'll cover, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll list just one slide of what, what I think are the, the Git resources that I found most helpful when I was learning to Git and converting to Git. Um, it's, it's one of the advantages of Git is there's a huge amount of stuff out there, but that then means you can't read all of it, so some advice might be helpful there. We'll do a quick, quick Git. Tutorial. We'll talk about the pros and cons of Git, and that's tougher than it looks because there's a wide range of opinions about that. And I spent quite a bit of time rattling around the web building that section up. We'll talk about workflows, then we'll get into modularization using Git, and, and there's very much a question mark on this is that we'll talk about some possible action plans. Um, Okay, let's go back and start at the beginning. Why change? This is the big picture of why change. Uh, if, if, if you're a juggler, I think even though I'm not a juggler, yeah. Is that you, Payman? No, that's not me. <laughs> I, I downloaded this from Google Images, and it's, I don't put the copyright on it, so I probably won't put this in the mailing. But I mean, almost anybody can probably juggle one ball. Probably most people are coordinated, maybe coordinated enough to juggle two, three, I don't know, and then as you get on, and then you reach a point where no one in the world can juggle the balls. It, it doesn't, in other words, juggling doesn't, doing it, handling balls that way, which I'm using as a metaphor for libraries, 
It doesn't scale. It just doesn't scale. No matter how good you get, till you get it still, more people can add more balls than it does not scale. Um, so the motivation in terms of boost is we need we do need to scale up to more life. We want to scale up to more libraries. Um, there's also a motivation that there's a strong developer preference for Git. I think by by a number of our key developers, and I believe that that number will increase because one of the observations I make is that most people, that many people, that try Git. It ends up being their preferred version control system, and it's often a pretty strong preference, too, right? It's the first step in, in improving our overall infrastructure is to look at a version control system. Um, let me, one other thing I want to say here, that, uh, I never could figure out where to put this in, so I'll just say it. In looking, I'm looking at resources for Git. There is one thing I don't like about Git, and that is in some of the other, some of the er, particularly some of the really early Git folks were extremely negative about other version control systems. And they said, and, and in fact, the first, you know, I assume, I don't know any names, but I assumed a very well done, known person who was involved right from the start would be in a, would, you know, that I could watch their video. And I, and I stop, I don't want to watch videos where people who use a different version control system are described as stupid. Mm -hmm. I don't want to watch a video where it's alleged that other version control systems don't work at tasks which millions of people successfully use them to do, okay? That luckily, Git has moved away a lot from those kind of people, but just be aware they're out there, just move on, because there are plenty of resources where people damn well know that Subversion and some other systems for some problems work just fine, and in fact are preferred solutions for some problems. Uh, anyway, here's, there's some books about Git out there. The uh, now this is a new one for me, but I think our internet connections here are strong enough. I can click on the damn thing and actually get it. Um, yeah, this, this uh, ProGit book, which you can download the whole thing. Uh, I had bookmarked uh, a bunch of the books. The one I kept, you know, and first when I had questions, I'd go to several of them and read them. The, the time and time again, this was the one that, to me, anyway, resonated. I could understand it. I didn't. Well, it's it's um, updated. I guess the guy who makes his living writing Git books or doing Git, being a Git guru, and he keeps it up to date, and that's nice as new features get added. So, and he works at GitHub. He does. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's hosted on GitHub. And uh, so then that's just the link that's just to the, uh, to the uh, table of contents. So that's, that's my, for those of you that need a, re a resource recommendation, uh, that's, that's the uh, that comes back. Um, here's an interesting one for subversion users. If, if you sort of need to get going on Git, um, and um, you don't want to just start and do a whole lot of reading. You just want to try a few things, or, or when you are just starting going. This, that crash course thing, what that does is it shows you for a whole bunch of common operations, it shows you the subversion command to do it. And then it shows you, as I say, the git command that does the identical thing. And well, I, I never look at it anymore, but while I was getting going, I found that crash course going to be uh, <coughs> GitHub is a cloud, uh, it's, it's a uh, sort of cloud computing uh, host for, uh, I don't know what it does, does it, have to be, it doesn't have to be open source because you can, if you pay the money, you can make the, Repositories private, so it's just mm -hmm. a, it's a cloud repository service. 
Uh, we are using it. We found it useful. It's very easy to use. Uh, if, if you just want a recommendation for some place to start out, real easy, get yourself a, you know, a cloud site. It is more or less basically if you want it for personal use, uh, you can just uh, install it. And, well, you don't have to. What you don't have to even install it. It's just yes, exactly. there. Uh, yeah, for personal use where you don't pay them any money, your repos are public. That you know they, they want five bucks a month or something, and then you you know, and then they have a slightly big structure. But it's a good one to get started at, I think. Um, for those of you that are Windows users, and um, there are a lot of Windows users in this world, me included, and some of us like graphical user interface to version our version control systems. And some subset of those have been using Tortoise SVN. And um, so there's also a Tortoise Git. And it is going, there is going to be almost no learning curve because the way Tortoise Git was developed was to fork the source code from Tortoise SVN and go through and where our command actually got issued under the covers, changed it to, a, to an SVN or, or a Git command. So it's extremely familiar. Uh, it's, it's still a bit buggier than Tortoise SVN, but they're issuing updates on a very regular schedule and whacking bugs off. And I, I, filed an intermit, intermittent bug, a book, bug report and an intermittent bug. They're always hard to, and I know it's there because other people signed on and said, yeah, I'm seeing this too, but their developers have never been able, you know, but that, that was a fair amount of effort trying to try that. John's going uh, to Atlassian, the people who make Jira and Confluence, they have a pretty professional grade Git browsing tool um, that works on Windows and other operating systems called SourceTree, and it's free. And you can do really nice uh, stuff that you can do with Tortoise Git. Yeah, I didn't have time to research others. Uh, well, it's relatively new. I think it's before, I think it's since your research. Okay. Well, I, I, I basically, the, the graphical ones, I didn't research because I was running out of time. Yeah, I mean, and, and you also, some people like to see, see the version control integrated with their IDE, mm -hmm. for example. And um, uh, Xcode. Uh, the one that Apple, a lot of Apple folks use, not earlier versions, but version four, which just started shipping pretty recently. Yeah, four three. Or, or, well, you know, yeah. developers had shipped a year ago, but I think public only shipped months ago. Anyway, it's it uh, has Git integrated, I believe, with Xcode. I, I haven't used it. So. Yeah. Um, Git flow is another interesting one. I've got a separate sli slide. There's an awful lot out there about Git, so your favorite search engine is uh, a good tool. You know, just ask the question, and you often get a, a very clear. I've, I've cleared an awful lot of questions in my mind simply by posing it as a question to Google. Yeah. Uh, Are there any tools to take a subversion repository and Sort of auto convert for Git. Yep. yep. <laughs> okay. Covered later. Several okay. slides. Yeah. Actual demo if we were don't run out of time. Uh, here's a, a little bit at a high level view of Git design stuff. Version control taxonomy. There's two kinds of version control systems in this world. There, there are centralized ones, and, and uh, there are distributed ones. Oh, I thought they were the good ones and the stupid ones. <laughs> <laughs> That's somebody else's text. Oh, okay, it ain't mine. Okay. And I don't know, maybe there's some other kinds, but this is the only ones that I ever, you know, are on my radar screen. Uh, and um, the, the, the subversion, of course, is an example of a centralized one. Got a central repo with all the history and branches and tags, and then the working copy contains only a view of the files as, uh, as of a specific subtree at a specific point in time and nothing more. 
distributed version control every copy, both the public ones that might be up on the cloud that you think of as sort of server kind of stuff, and your own working copy is a full repository, 100%. To the point where, in an emergency, you could use it as a backup. Um, everything, for all history, all branches, all tags, everything is on your machine. It's it's surprising that it doesn't show up a huge amount of disk space either. Or it's all Delta and whatnot. It's not. And besides, the space is cheap. Space is cheap. Yeah. Um, a working copy, your, what, what you think of as your working copy is, is a, a, view, a view of the files as of a specific subtree at a specific point in time. But all the rest is there. And you can, and you can switch at a, you know, at a moment's notice to some different view, different you know, command or whatever. So th those are huge differences. And almost all of the Everything else falls out from these two. It's just fall out from these two differences. So I'm jumping ahead, maybe. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if we took boost and moved it to GIF, does that mean on my local desktop I would have the entire boost repository, even if I want one or two libraries? Or um, Sort of the the the, the, the ten thousand the view from thirty six thousand or maybe a hundred thousand feet is yes to that. The real simple answer. It's more the real answer is is the way you would actually module or modularize boost uh, is it's a much more nuanced answer than that. But uh, and as you get to the full end of the version of boost, you can go there. Dave and Daniel and different people are going to be talking about it. You may have a very, very small subset that's actually fully installed. Yeah, I, you know, we're going to have to get into that. But, uh, let's just look at this was the ProGit book's view of this. The central system, your, your central repo, or the only repo, uh, has got, let's say you've got a, a, one file in it, named file. Version three, version two, version one are all in, all there in the in the repo, and what's out on the clients is just one version of that file, and it may be maybe you can set it to you know the different editions, so to speak. But uh, that's that that's you don't have anything else, and there's there's the uh, there's the the graphical view of the same thing that. Uh, your working copies, they may be set so your sort of view that you see is just one one of the versions of file, but everything is down under there. So among other things, if this connection separates at some point, you're still up and running. Um, and I've been, I mean, I'm using this all the time on this trip was I'm updating these slides and I'm pushing them out to the cloud. I'm using Dropbox as a <laughs> and it's happening. I'm not even touching it. And I know I'm secure. So if my laptop disappears, I borrow somebody else's laptop and I'm, I'm, I'm covered. Including updates and including retrieving those updates later and not losing them. Note also that these two work so called working copies are just checkouts. They could communicate with each other because uh, they, all the information is there. You're not. And, um, and as of today, the boost history in Git is only 17% larger than the current 1.49 release. So the entire complete history is, is roughly equivalent to the size of one release. Yeah, we're 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 none of it. None of what I'm talking about here is pie in the sky. Right. Okay. Everything I'm talking about is production quality, widely used useful on today's machines, works good on slow networks, fast networks, no network, no connectivity at all. 
Hey, we're going to do a quick tutorial, and this is really got to be really quick, but it, it should sort of give at least a little bit of the ideas of, of uh, the people who've never been used here. Um, the way we're going to structure it, structure our, our, our simple library is um, I'm using the cloud symbol for the bare repository, what starts out as a bare repository that's at, you, often somewhere in the cloud. Now it may be on your local network and it's on a server and two or three developers are hitting it or, or uh, my, my hookup at home is I've got a, the, the one that's the, the cloud is essentially a big hard drive in my desktop. It's my D drive, second drive, and my wife machine is backing up to it. But it's conceptually, it's, it's in the cloud, and more and more nowadays it really is in the cloud, even for, for one-off personal projects. And then you got a developer who showed that as a, uh, as a hard disk. Uh, right, and he says, developer Jane, I always name my projects after my cats, and Jane's actually passed on, but she was a, she, she uh, spent a lot of time in my office, and, okay. Now, <laughs> um, we're going to uh, work with a, uh, a simple project, and I'm going to try to I'm going to tr try to do this live. Um, I'm going to try. GitHub. This is my GitHub account. Uh, and <coughs> if I scroll down a little bit, it says, yeah, it's showing new repository. I'm create a new, I hope this works. And I'm going to create a new repository and I'm going to simple. And Then it tells you a bunch of other stuff. I don't do that. The, I'm not, not sure why they do it exactly that way. The next step thing is the, the Git config, presumably you're already configured. Uh, the next step, I guess there's a reason for doing it exactly that well, way. Well, the reason, the main reason is that, that working with a totally empty Git repository yeah. is a little weird. And so they want you to get something in there. Okay, okay. Well, here's the library. If you had told it to initialize with the readme, then you wouldn't have that, those steps at all. Yeah. Here's what I do. Mm -hmm. It's going to take a few minutes, but I'm watching the time. CMD projects. You don't need a space. No, it's a it's a bug in uh, CD, but I use it all the time. <laughs> it's also a bug in CD, in which, which uh, I use all the time. That it uh, it will accept uh, forward slashes. And, and so I can write long scripts that run on either uh, Linux or you know, some other or, or Windows. Uh, now I'm going to say, one thing I want to start out with, I'm going to say get uh, help on. Because one of the nice things about Git is its help system, and if you're just starting out, that's real important. And let's see if it works. When you run a help command on Git, at least on Windows, it fires off a graphical manual page through your browser, and that's the, you get the, the descriptions and whatnot. It's just a little easier reading, a little faster learning. Uh, it's a nice. Nice feature, and so uh, I wanted to point that out to people. 
Okay, now we're going to do the we're going to do the basic operate one of the really basic operations here. It's the operation you use to start up a repository in, in that you're going to work with is clone. So we're going to do here. Okay, it warned me that I've combed an empty repository. That's expected. Well, that was the that was That's the thing that kind of they give you a longer set of instructions to avoid the warning, I guess. Sort of. Yeah, they don't want you to be alarmed. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, if you're if you're new, you so don't be alarmed by this. Okay. So I cloned this a repository, and it it went in. I didn't give a specific uh, directory name, so it chose the same name. Hopefully, simple. So I can do the CD same. There I am, isn't it? Oh, uh, uh, well, well, I'll just, I'll do, I've got, uh, I, I, I have, um, for you, uh, POSIX aficionados, I have, uh, when installed on this machine, and so I can also do LS and A, so I get everything. And notice that the, that there's nothing. There are no regular files in this in this uh, simple because we didn't put anything in. Uh, there is a .git repo, and that's the, that's the hidden file where when you say the whole repo is there, it's in there. I've never had to look in there. I suspect I had. I do occasionally just out of curiosity, but I mean, as far as I know, to get going and use Git successfully, you don't have to know anything at all about what's in there. Let's, uh, you know, uh, do, do, uh, create a file. general form of, of git commands when you're using the command line versions. Git and the name of the command. And this is, you know, we've seen this sort of thing, lots of other stuff. Uh, let's see. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to add this readme file. And what that does is uh, essentially it's, well, it's very similar to subversion. It stages it, but it hasn't done anything. Um, so if I really want to do something with it, and this is where uh, where things start to differ radically from subversion, I'm going to uh, say git and I, it, on the slide I show some other things that you could do, but uh, let's see, I'm going to do git command Finish message, and this is oops. Hmm. I guess I hit a I hit a I hit the wrong key, and it just looks like it went end of the commit without a message. Huh? So much for that. Uh, now, at this point. We've still got, we've got README in there, it's got some bytes in it. The commit is a commit to the local repository. It is not gone out on the cloud. It is purely private at this point. At this point. Um, and that's where we start to get this radical difference between the distributed version control systems and 
the central repository system so that I can continue, I can create branches, I can do this, I can do all sorts of things just locally. But, and, and, and that's, how that's the way you tend to work, is you keep moving ahead, I put, create some other files in this project, I custom and whatnot. Uh, at some point, and, and a lot of times, that repository up in the, up in the cloud, you want you them on the branch that is traditionally called master with git. You try to, a lot of workflows, they try to keep that a clean branch. So somebody else who downloads that, links to it, downloads it from the cloud, clones it, knows that master is the clean branch. That's, that's, uh, you don't have to, it's just a convention. And, and that's assumed. Um, let's uh, say, and let's, so, okay, so what happens when we want to do more than, uh, I, I did a bunch of stuff in several commits, but I'll show you how to do that, but it, it really, um, you, understand, you guys are all smart, not going to this. What do I want to do when I want the, um, you know, the copy up on the cloud to be updated. You know, how do I commit to that, essentially? Well, what I want to do then is get push. You hear about pushing and pulling a lot, and that's your main methods of interacting with the repo that's up in the cloud somewhere. So I'm going to do git push and um, Which, where do I want to push a origin? That's a name that's been created locally just to give names to different places. You could be pushing to several different repositories. But I'm just going to do origin. I think that can, that will default too in some cases, but I, I've forgotten the exact set of cases. If you clone, then it's, it's the default. Is that if you Yeah. All right. And I'm going to see. I'm going to explicitly name the branch I'm pushing to. Again, normally that defaults. I'm trying to show you things. Let's see if this will actually work. Okay, so now if, if from this moment on, if somebody else tries to go to simple, but it's a public repository, you can actually do it, do it, do a clone on it, you'll now get reading it and pushed up there. Uh, I think that's all I want to do at that point, and then we're going to go back to, uh, does that at least give you guys a flavor so that you could maybe try a few things yourself and start from learning big? What's the advantage of basically doing a local commit and a global commit as opposed to just a commit? Um, Big picture advantage is that it enables you, that you can come up with a vast number of different and some of them very innovative workflows. And um, we're going to look at Gitflow later, which is one of them. And I'll maybe defer that, but I mean I think that's the big picture thing that if if, if by having essentially multi levels of commit, and only this one local level is actually called commit, the rest of the push or whatever. Uh, John? Well, one big one is that in a submodel like subversion, if you're going to be pushing up to a repository that everyone else is going to get your change, you don't want to, you don't want to commit until your stuff works. But with Git, the philosophy is commit often. So as you're working, you're taking little snapshots of your progress, but you don't push that series of commits until you've gotten to a working state. I see so that, that progress is, uh, most, is maintained, so you, you yeah. actually keep history of that progress. Well, it's part of what falls out of all of this is that branching and merging is really easy, and it works. It's very reliable, even for newbie developers, even for new people coming. So 
here's an, a, a very practical case that people report in practice. If you have a team going and it's a bunch of experienced people. A new person comes in. In the past, they, with subversion, they're typically very nervous about committing to the main repo because one, one repo because they get screamed at badly if they break the bill. You know, you've heard that one before. Okay. So what they do is they create local branches, which are cheap, instantaneous. Remember, it's local. It's all fast. It's always fast. And they do stuff on the local branch. They try it. They try to build on the local branch. It work. Maybe they share that. They may share it with some other people and whatnot. And it just it, it, it frees you up to, to create workflows that are perfect for your environment, your situation. And your workflow is going to be very different from somebody else's workflow. John should, should tell them about the tool that, that you wrote for me that I haven't started using yet, but I really want to. That thing that, that auto commits? Oh, oh yeah, Git Monitor. I, I wrote something that runs in the background and it basically is very resource efficient at checking if there's any files that have changed in the last minute and it just creates a little a little commit in a place where you won't be able to see it unless you look for it but you've got all your progression of work there and it's very very cheap and uh, uh, it doesn't it doesn't slow down your machine and that's your local commit right yeah right okay. so but the reason the reason that this is so cool is like one thing that happens is when you get really into development Sometimes you, you develop one, you do make one thing that should be a logical change, and then you just you flow right into the next thing. You're not thinking, right? You're not yeah. thinking about committing in between, and you can you can now take this history that you've got, squash together the commits that go together, and make the history that you're going to publish that actually has the the coherent change set. Yeah, yeah. No, I see that. I, the, the the thing that worries me is. Somebody's doing a lot of changes and they're not ready to, you know, push the whole thing out, but then their workstation dies or the disk goes south or something. Part of the reason you, you commit is so yeah, that you commit don't lose your branch. Work. You so what? You commit your branch. Put you your branch up. No, but oh, okay, so but yeah, basically you, you the same. use branching. Most Git developers, whether somebody told them this to do this or whether they just figured it out for themselves. They find they branch. I mean, branching isn't a once in a while thing. It's it's in, if you're doing, working on a lot of little stuff, it can be many many times a day. Okay, when you branch, that pushes it up. No, no, it's it doesn't have to push it up because it's on your. It, it's but what if you're, you're, you're what if that dies? Okay, you you can push. I pushed up master. Okay, there. I could have pushed. My work might say it's an important branch, feature branch or something. I could have pushed my branch up. Okay, I don't have to just push master up. Okay, so you do have to remember to push. That's yeah. the main. One of the things that uh, that I have tried when I use Git when I work with a bunch of people is is I make lots of branches that last only a short period of time. Um, I will, you know, I'm working on some feature stuff, but. They're, it's not ready to go when somebody sends me a bug report. I branch the master, I work on that new branch to fix the bug report, and I merge back to branch master and push it out. And then that branch dies. Yeah, Git flow makes that easier. Oh, okay. so okay. then that you haven't gone and saved it and you'll never get rid of it and all that stuff. Okay. But, yeah, but the point is you go off, you do some work, you come back. And then I switch back to my feature branch, and I'm right back where I was working on this new feature that nobody else has seen yet. It's, it's, Think of a similar idea is with C++. When you start using C++, if you, if you were a C programmer, you used it for a little while as just a better, in fact, you hardly even did any better stuff. And then you start introducing new things. And some of these workflows are, are more going to be used by people who've had at least a little bit of experience. Let's, let's keep going. Yeah. So, there's, there's an, and then we get the second developer working, and I'm, I'm not going to bother with that. Uh, Do you give your cats people names? <laughs> yeah, normally. We get, got one that had a name, Meow, now, so we uh -oh. normally we give them people names. Well, Harry, also, Harry's a longer cat, so. Oh. <laughs> oh. 
<laughs> yeah, no, all our cats always have people. Because we don't have children. We're child free by choice, yeah. so our cats always have people. Things, so. uh, but let's move on to the pros and cons of yeah. This is very important to some of the boost people. This is, and this is my categorization of pros and cons after it's de dependent on a lot of reading. And it seems to me that the, the, I break them down in life because it's the first order get advantages over subversion, over subversion. Um, and, and it's going to depend on you and your project which of these are most important. Some of them may not be particularly important at all in your project. And, and likewise with the second order and third order. But clearly the operations are a lot faster. It's local. I mean, most of the stuff, you know, all this branching we're talking about and other stuff. You want to do a blame, you want to do blogs. It's all local. It's not going out across the, the internet. That means it's much faster. It's easy. A lot of stuff that you do, and this is the stuff you do all the time. We're not talking about corner cases. We're talking about stuff you do many, many times a day if you're working in, in very active development. It's lots, of, ten times faster, more than that sometimes. It means you can work offline. You can keep doing commits, branch creation merges, looking up logs, history, blah, blah, blah. You do it, you don't have to have an internet connection. Then the, multi, the, the fact that it, that it, um, has multi-level commits, and, and, and that, that allows you to create a lot of additional work, um, workflow support. Private, time and time again, you find people when you, that are used Git a while, and you say, what's the advantage? They, they call out the private local branches, branches that are created only for the pur your purposes, and either they're, they may be abandoned. I mean, it, here's, you know, let's say you try some brainiac idea you've got, and it turns out to be brain dead idea, and you just <laughs> blow that one away. Uh, but it, but you merge, it turns out to be a good idea. It works. You merge it in to one of the public branches and push that. But people love that. That that people use that way. And the other another first order advantage is there's no single point of failure because every Developer as a full back. I mean, you can hear. I mean, that's a literal. Yeah. Are they truly all created equal? There's no one that's considered the latest and greatest, or no? there. They can be by convention. By can be yeah. That oh, that's the correct answer. Okay. By convention, one. Yeah, by convention, your cloud one. Is the, you know. Because that's the one that people, it pushed you. Yes. Yeah. And, and uh, but, but that's by convention, it's not by. And other people will have five ones. They'll make clones of yours and make them public because, you know, and then there's tools for, you know, moving commits between them and kinds of stuff. So, so is it possible to mark one as, as you only push to it, you know? push from it or something like that, so it's the top of the tree, or? It would be a, a write-only repository. I think that'd be kind of useless. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, 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 no. I, I, what am I trying to get? You can't do it. People, <laughs> people, people have successfully figured out a number of different relationships. And, um, you know, boost. We don't want to reinvent the wheel every day. We'll have a certain way we do it, and we're going to look at that later and just keep, keep yeah. chugging. And so I'm getting my head around this distributed right. versus but central. The easiest, the easiest way, to, from my point of view, is which one is the master? Because That's the one that the releases get built from. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, but you way. could the next day say, oh, he's no longer the master. Uh, this guy's master, right? You yes. build relations yeah, off of that. You, you could, could do that kind of thing. I think for other sort of stability reasons, you probably don't do too much of that, but you could. And if, maybe for some odd situation that I've not thought of, it might be something you would do regularly. 
So a second order. I, I need to keep moving because I. I uh, uh, second order advantages, but I think of second order. Merging often works better and is easier, particularly for non-expert users. That time and time that comes across when you get out on the web and look for what what experience real people and real projects. And this includes reports from both open source kind of projects, like there have some similarities with those, and also from people that are in more corporate and organizational environments and don't have a lot of similarities with those. I think what we're seeing here are, are, are two things. One's just a cumulative effect of the other advantages. But uh, also, with, and this one's very kid specific, one of the key design criteria of Boost was better merging. And like a lot of projects, yeah. what? The key design criteria, you said of Boost. Oh, I said, I should have said it, yeah. Um, and, and you know, when, when you design a piece of software and you've got one particular thing right from the get go, as it were, you wanted to, uh, 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 you wanted to work well. It does, and and, and merging. You know, just it's, sometimes it's a little hard to put your finger on why, but it, it, this is stuff. Thousands of people are reporting the same results, so I think we can believe it. And it's certainly been my experience, and then everybody will talk about it, basically. Branching is often used more effectively, which we've already talked about, particularly by non-experts. Um, GIF, GIF isn't just about aficionados of version control systems. In, in fact, if that was our sole audience, we'd probably use them more purely. Yes. Um, so, and then people report aiding newbies getting started in a project, minor branching, ease of branching is a big help. And then more workflows we've mentioned. Some other uh, good positives, it has a nice set of minor features. Uh, stash, which is where you're working on something and the boss works, oh, our most important customer is, you know, immediately shift to something else and you just say, stash everything I'm doing. It. And it, and then you start working on this other thing, and when the emergency passes, you pop the stack, essentially, and you're back to the work. I've done that for years. I have batch files for subversion. So it's not the subversion can't do it. I've done it all the time with subversion, but I had to run my own damn batch files. This is it's better when it's part of the package, because then everybody knows about it. It has extensive support for moving from subversions. There is a git SVN command. There is, I mean, it, it, you can you can mirror, I mean, John would do that, right, with, with uh, Boost History. You can mirror, essentially mirror an SVN repository so that every time it changes, you, you're, I mean, there's big time, heavy, heavy tools to, if necessary, for long periods of time, keep the two repositories in sync. So, if we had a corporate subversion repository and we haven't convinced the powers that be to move to Git, the developers could use Git and just mm -hmm. commit I, to the subversion repository. Yeah, I, and and I, I, haven't, I keep, when I see them at committee meetings, I keep meaning to ask them this is true because I've read it, and not, but not in his own words. I believe Jason Merrill who's one of GCC's key developers and has been for years and years. I've been, I'm pretty sure, I've been told anyway, and it appears on some websites that, that he does that and has for some time in his maintenance of GCC, his work on GCC, and he's the one that's implementing a bunch of these new C++ 11 is long-term, heavy-duty developer, long-term committee member. Uh, there's good community support for, for Git. Uh, Online, good online docs, uh, the general ecosystem is very strong, very strong. Lots of resources out there. Uh, the network effect, and here I'm using the term network as a, um, a an economist uses it, and that, that's when, when everybody, 
or most people drive, I mean, here's a little, this is a stupid example. If everybody drive, if most people drive on the right hand side of the road in the country you're in at the moment, there's strong advantages for everyone to drive, or a large, or, or a new driver to drive on, and not, not try to do something different. But uh, it's why eventually over the years there are many fewer operating systems than there used to be. It's why Microsoft office for so many years was ubiquitous because so many people knew it, you went out to hire a secretary, and that secretary often already knew it. It's a network effect. It's something that's a positive reinforcement of cycle that occurs when something successful. Uh, Git is very well known, it's used, and that reduces boosts support, essentially our support costs, the trouble and whatnot. Uh, here's an intangible, the last one I'm going to mention. Um, Git is, is often developers report that it is pleasant to use. I've heard that a number of times. I've had the same sensation. I think it's where I'm expecting trouble, and I do something, and it just works, slick as anything, and no, it's, I'm not the only one that's uh, let, let's, Any questions on boost positives? Let's get positive. Or get positive. Mm -hmm. To boost. Look at some negatives. First, we'll look at the ones that impact boost. Changing, I don't care how good any system is, changing version control systems is a pain in the ass. And, and so I think we need to acknowledge that and not sweep it under the cover. And that's part of the reason why we're having this kind of educational session, partially educational session, try to reduce that pain. I think with, we can mitigate it greatly with it, but it is. It's more than a notion to change a version control system. There's a, uh, an issue, and I say may or may not, because I think there's some solutions to this apparently out there. Where there, there, you have a, a bug, as most people do, you have a bug tracking system that often has ties back or pointers back to, into your version control system. And, you know, it's, references, chain sets, and things like that. Um, there is some kind of, am I correct in saying there is some kind of a tool available to migrate that, migrate a track that's been in sub, you know, subversion, a tracking system for it, subversion users, migrate that to then to track the same history in, in a GIF. So it may not be a severe problem, a severe problem, but it's it's an issue. Stephen, I think, was the first one brought it to my attention. We we, we want to, if we can, we want to mitigate that stuff. Man, here's a bunch of negatives. I want to mention them. I do not believe any of these impact boost, but I think that people who claim it is the end of the world, they've got their head in the sand because it's got some really bad deficiencies as seen by some situations. It has no support for locks. Now, that, uh, I've never locked, liked locks. Boost never has used the locking repository system. Well, we use CBS We use CBS, okay, excuse me, but we didn't use the locks in CBS. Right. I mean, we use a system that could lock, but we didn't, it's just not, I don't perceive that as a problem for Boost. It's a real problem for some people. Um, Cloning can be expensive for very, cloning's a basic operation in, in the system. It can be too expensive if you have a humongously large repo, a terabyte repo. Um, the, the usual comment on that is that if you've got a single repo that's a terabyte, you've got other problems you need to address, drastic problems, Anyway, it's not, it doesn't affect Boost because I, I timed some stuff and Boost, it's running, I think it's run, you know, combing and whatnot, it's running lightning, you know, it's limited by network speed basically. Mm -hmm. And it's not that many well, bytes. I mean, the first clone is going to be okay. The, it's big, but I mean, in relation, to, it's, it's, it's very much uh, a, a, it's, 
the, the scale of the time it takes to do it is appropriate for the size of the repo. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you don't expect, you expect the simple repo I use for a demo to clone instantly, you expect a clone of the whole boost street to take some minutes, depending on the speed of your memory. Um, if also, if you're a user who does not care about the boost history, you can ask for a shallow probe. You can say, I only want it to go back 100 commits, and then it will be lightning fast. Yeah. I bet that's going to save you all that much, because, right, you, you said that, oh yeah, it, it will, because it only transfers the compressed stuff. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so it's not, okay, not, these are, these can be disadvantages. They don't, I don't think they impact boost at all. Um, if there, a couple of people gave examples where they work in an environment where, where a whole lot of their development environment involves online tools. So the fact that a distributed version control system continues to deliver to be useful when, you're, when you lose connectivity doesn't often, in fact, in that environment, doesn't really matter because you, not, you didn't just lose connectivity to to some cloud repo, you've lost connectivity to some tool that, that you need. It doesn't affect those. Um, kind of thing. We'll have to make sure that some of the upstream stuff, local testing, works. I don't think it's going to be any problem to boost stuff. Is it an obliteration problem? I mean, this is, if you've got stuff that you want, it, that's going to have to be totally all traces of it removed. You probably shouldn't have put it in a version <laughs> in a version control system. But, but distributed ones, it's even worse. Um, well, if someone if someone you know, commits a library and then sometime later it turns out that it was a copyright violation, the copyright owner yeah, comes that's, in and says, that's, made it all go away. Yeah. It, it's legal requirements. Uh, I sold some intellectual property. Part of the agreement was that I get rid of all everything, all my copies of it, I mean, it, which wasn't possible. I can't go into a backup tape years <laughs> old and pull out the backup of a whole system and pull it out. Yeah. yeah. You say particularly difficult, but not impossible. Is it, if you well, want some obliterate, will it eventually propagate I out? I mean, you or? can go around and no. find all the copies. And, no. And, no, so no. anybody can store a Git repository, they can store a clone of your Git repository anywhere they want. Yeah. Once right. they get a hold of it, and then but that's the same. The next time they but that's the same for any other. They're not going to say, "Oh, I got a message for this you. Is, get rid of." <laughs> this is no different from any other version control system in terms of what's possible. Right. Right. People yeah. could yeah. you could make a clone of a subversion repository too. Yeah, anybody can do that. You can use sync or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it really yeah. makes it possible. Yeah, 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 yeah. But okay. people will. Ma I want. This is due diligence. This is looking at what people bring up and worry about and saying, does it impact boost? The answer is no, it does not. Access control can sometimes be an issue. It is not for us because uh, we would like better access control than we have, but when we modularize, we get the access, the finer grain, the finer granularity access control that we want, and so it's, it turns out to not be a problem. Um, Okay, the last one before we got sort of move on to some other stuff is why not material? Um, this is my, that's the whole thing up there. It's my take on it. it, it uh, Imperial's the main competitor. It says the technical features boost need is a, a co apparently a more coherent interface. It's widely respected by uh, version control aficionados. But Git seems to be the one that that is used and preferred by more developers. Even the people that say that they think Mercurial is better say, but actually, I recommend, I mean, there are two or three people who have done this on the Boost Band, but for Boost, Git is better. So I, I just, I'm not going to, I consider that it would be a waste of my time, because it would be, it would take a long time to fully inform, come up to an informed decision on that, which is, yeah, I have to learn how to use Mercurial now and then run it back, and I don't want to do that. The, the network effect, the network effect kicks in, is kicked in. Most of the boost people that, that are pushing for this are all are 
pushing for DF, or distributed version of DF pushing for DF. I, I, I think you might have exaggerated it a little bit. Um, the people that, that like Mercurial better, what, I, what I've noticed that Musk has said was, you know, switching to Switching to any DVCS is a massive improvement over where we are now, and I would ex I would take it if if that's you know what he switched to. I happen to prefer Mercurial, but just do it, do something. <laughs> yeah. So we don't hear the same the same kind of uh, thing from a lot of the Git people. Huh? <laughs> For sure. Yeah, uh, I'm. I'm not. I want to talk a little bit about, real briefly, about workflows and then in, get into modularization. Um, if we're talking about Gitflow. Uh, Gitflow started out as this guy in a blog said, look, here's how we do, do branching at, at my a company or his organization. And, and the blog, about, I think about three years ago, and the, the, the blog posting got picked up and why the people looked at it and said, geez, this guy's right. This is a better way of doing stuff. Um, and, and, and some other people, I believe, or somebody, I think it was the original guy, thought it was a, a good enough model, of, uh, a good enough uh, workflow model, that they produced some extensions to Git that make it even easier. So that stuff that would take two, three commands is one command. There's a reference to that and uh, mention a section of that that I found. Uh, what I'm going to do is, here, here's the, uh, you can actually see it up there. This is a workflow, and I, I have not used this, but it's really easy, when you think about workflows, it's really easy to envision. And what strikes me about this, and I suspect that I, this is caught on, is that this is an incredibly scalable workflow. Because the, the only, it, it still functions, or something that looks like enough, enough like it, if only the development, develop, the, the uh, branch that's typically called develop, and the branch that's typically called master. So one developer works in a very sequential manner can start out. Then things get a little bigger, the hot fix thing maybe comes up. Dave, uh, what's Okay, I'm sorry, I just wanted to clarify one thing, because I, I think you, you're talking about what's typically called master and what's typically called develop. And I, my impression is that this guy's system, what most people use as their master branch, he calls develop. Yeah, right. and and his master branch, his yeah, branch right. called master uses for releases. Release, yeah. So and i and it's certainly we would change the <coughs> name. Well, some of the names don't matter because some of this is local workflow for a particular library. But the 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 boost super repo either has to we either have to agree on a standard name for the release branch. Or we have to have invented something that has to be some mechanism so that the the, the uh, project is. Right. But anyway, that that a lot of these branches, as you add developers, you start and you know you get bigger and bigger. A project scales up. You start using more and more of this, and so I me and then you start doing these 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 I mean, I'm going to call them release branches. They're release candidates. Yeah. is what they are, is what we would tend to call them, or see. Um, so I think that it's what struck me about this one, this, this workflow, is, is the scalability. That it could start with a really small, pretty small project, and just the same basic workflow could scale up to a really huge project. And maybe that, maybe I'm, I haven't done that, so I have just a supposition. Anyway, that's just that's a little thing on workflows. Let's switch to modularization using Git. How do we modularize? Well, first I guess we should do what's the motivation to modularize it? We want to scale Boost up to many more libraries. 
And that implies decentralization and implies decoupling. So this is my, my take. Uh, but I, I think this is particularly controversial. Uh, separating, out, separating boost on a per library basis and the per library modules achieves that. It's a well known way of doing this sort of thing. It's not new ground. Maybe you just refuse, but uh, it's, it's been studied in general and it's been studied and tested for boost. We know that uh, on an experimental basis, we can go and do it, try it, kick the tires. Um, it's hard to meet, even if we stay the same size. We, our regression testing, our release management, and our develop our developer workflow, our distribution install needs, they're really hard to meet with the current structure. Um, a modularized structure, if it's even half well, way well done. But modularization is pretty simple in, in, in conceptually, and so I don't, I'm not, and also it's not something that you don't cast it in the concrete if you find, I mean, some of these minor things like pending stuff, you're a little unsure as to where it might go. Well, we get it wrong in one or two, or separate one into two, or, you know, but we'll get it right. I think it's too simple to get wrong as far as clearly per libraries. Nobody's arguing. So if that's the motivation, there's our motivation. Uh, I, and this is me, I want to call, there are other requirements, certainly. There are a couple of key uh, requirements that I, that I think that we're going to be miserable if we're going to have to be lynched, as they were saying last night in the session, if, uh, if, if we don't meet these requirements. And one is we want to preserve history. Our, our, our history uh, embodied in Flight Subversion right now is very important. That's what John's been working at. And, <coughs> so that we feel that modulo, perhaps, and not perfect now, but it's, I'll ask John to complain. As far as you know, once we get the, we should be able to work all of the ranges up. Yeah, so my, my, I won't call it done until it's a bit perfect. There will be no bit that was in some version that will not be in the bit. That meets that requirement. Um, so there's other infrastructure besides just the inputs. Yeah. Well, that's the we're, we're, okay. Now, the se but the second requirement is to preserve the user and developers infrastructure. And uh, we're going to talk about, and I think. Let me uh, by what I mean on the, by that is that both developers and users have immense investments in build setups. They don't just use a jam. They use various IDEs that have their own setups. They use May, Gunai, Trillium, C May, things as I mean, just an immense number of things. They got a lot of money from that. They don't want all of that stuff to break. And uh, at least not, I mean, it's not that you can't sometimes break things, but you got to have damn good reason. You can't just, you don't want to just arbitrarily. Great stuff, particularly when you don't have to. And you're going to see some demonstrations here. But we're not going to break this stuff. The proposed modular, modularization, and I've got their pictures at the end in case they weren't here. Uh, 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 well, Troy's not here. He, he was the original originator, and uh, then Dave has been spearheading this, this effort for a long time, and Daniel Pfeiffer here, and John Wigley are. They've been working real hard on this. And they're, they're the ones that have these test 
frameworks up on GitHub. You can clone them. You can work with them. It, this is really that collective group's design. I have been knowing for a so each library has its own public re uh, repository, can, can release asynchronously with the Boost, the Boost Super Project. The right permissions are controlled by that library's developers. Uh, so that if a, particularly a single developer library, if he goes missing in action, we, we will have a way to recover in Boost itself. We did that. And if one of one of one of our modules is relying on another one, and you know somebody changes something, and that breaks something, so they have to be coordinated. Yes. How do you handle that? Yeah. Yes. Um, um, I'm going to give you the short answer right now. Is the Boost Super Project doesn't say it's a file system. It doesn't just point to the file system. Points to a specific release, I guess you would say. It's a specific point in the subtree at a, 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 at a specific point in time, which is a release. Basically, the, each project all, always has a release ready version. Right. And so, and the tools involved are sophisticated enough, if so. Some dependency on file system one of it, no, there was two dependencies in one is on different version of file system. Then, I mean, you're hoping that zero install can, can maintain that. But, I mean, those are problems, okay? They're known problems, and people have worked out solutions. And, and we're going to hear a lot about that sort of part of the more sophisticated stuff we'll hear from Dave. And other people uh, tomorrow night at that. Uh, so then we get a super. Okay, so so uh, uh, within within we'll have to put some requirements on it, but within reason, libraries can choose their own workflows and they can they can uh, you know, deviate. There's no total requirement. There, there will be some specific things that we're going to do. Um, Boost Super Pro then there's a Boost Super Project. Um, conceptually, there doesn't have to be much in that, except uh, we're going to use the, or the proposal is to use the Git submodule feature. And so there would be the only thing in, the, conceptually, the only thing in the, the Boost Super Project uh, is the submodule, which are, I think, of as point of simulator or groups to, uh, to the individual libraries. It may have some common, particularly initially, it may well have a bit of common infrastructure in there, but it might, might have some release manual tools and whatnot. They, sooner or later, that stuff will even probably not go out, I kind of guess. In, in the, the super project, the right permissions there would be presumably, and I just put this in without talking to anybody, but I assume that it's primarily the boost release and infrastructure teams that need right permission in the super uh, repo and that I don't know why I like a little bit of developer and the sub libraries. Uh, I think we, we probably, to get going, we want all our public repos posted at the same site. And I, I, um, it's tentatively GitHub, I believe. However, I think we probably want to talk about that at a steering committee. And uh, there are some other places out there. That SourceForge nowadays has a vast number of development tools available. And I'm drooling over getting some of those. And I, well, I just, uh, to be able to take circuits. Did you try the Google Docs in this? Okay, but that's, it's a different, it, it's a different, you know, it, it, there's, they, some people in some organizations prefer to have all of their infrastructure centralized at a single place. And then, yeah, you can go out on the web and get anything you want, but 
the management of that gets. All right, so, so, so who's done? That's work? a different question. It doesn't really matter where the public goes. We'll, we will, I think, almost certainly post our public repos, both the libraries and the supermarket, at the same place. And it's probably going to be But it doesn't matter. If we have some problem if there's a total requirement of that, and we're, we're building systems that are larger as we'll say. I mean, just wherever it is now, five years from now, what's the chance of this? So I think in 10 years or 15 years, it's a zero chance. And it's just not going to be. So there's what it looks graphically. Super project. I, I noted which links are essentially read-only links and which links are essentially. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and this then, assumes there are two libraries. There's, there's two libraries in a total of three libraries. So somebody who's using Boost just basically goes to goes to the super project and they get all of Boost. Well, let, let's assume. Yeah, well, they get a very quick download because remember the super project, what's in there for each one of these uh, references to uh, the constituent projects is the equivalent of a sim. Okay, I mean, it's the Git equivalent. It's not. I, I understand. I'm just saying that, yeah. you know, you tell somebody they want, they want to go get the, you know, the current release of Boots, I say, SVNCO, and a while later they have all of this. Yeah, it's two commands in Git. Okay. So, um, if you want to get all of this, mm -hmm. the one of the things that we're thinking is, you know, getting all of Boost is getting to be less and less of a scalable option for a lot of people, and pretty soon I I hope that we'll have it set up so that people are regularly getting just the parts of Boost they want to work with, and that. That changes the picture. Of that does. That um, I'm just the, my, my, the my, boost my. is big enough. Uh, it has enough pieces in it that uh, we're going to need some tools for picking and choosing. Yes, I, and that's come that, to my talk. I come will, to, come, to, da come to Dave's yeah, talk. Yeah. 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 This no, talk. Yeah. 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 Okay, yeah. now. Yeah. Okay. Well, no, you mean, even you, mean, you know, I may not be the yeah. smartest. Yeah. Whatever card in the deck, but I, even I knew that someone would ask about that. Okay, here, here are the actual commands. Please, I, I'm, I, I'm a little concerned about everybody here, particularly sensibly with this number of people in the room, but I didn't want everybody to try to type these at the same time because there is some finite. We're running pretty good bandwidth here, but even here, I occasionally. Times from the end, but if we all try to do it at the same time. Yeah. So if after the word clone there you put dash dash recursive, then you don't have to do the sub module command. You end up with one command again. Well, yeah, you eliminate the third one. Yeah, you, yeah, you just say clone, just, clone recursive. Um, okay. To, and just to give you, since I'm asking you not to actually run these at this very moment, um, I ran them on this little machine, which is about a five-year-old, although it does have a solid-state disk in it, so it's, it's fast on the hard drive, but otherwise it's a little kid and really dated. On a DSL, a Verizon DSL connection, three megabits per second, if it's in good form. Uh, um, form it's usually about, no, that two is about the best I can get at it. The, uh, the git clone thing, the first one, because all that's in there is essentially pointers and stuff. It didn't, by the time I got around to time to getting ready to time it, it had already finished. Uh, See, so it doesn't take any time at all. And then the submodule on that on that rig, the uh, where you're going out to getting each of the individuals, uh, took 16 minutes. Uh, then. That infrastructure doesn't have, we can look, we can look at some stuff, but that does not have the under your uh, root. It's got a live script, or 
get live square creep. It does not have boost. It doesn't have the headers. The headers in a modularized scheme live in uh, live in the individual libraries. Now, so then we insert, and this is not going to be the command that anybody would use. No, no matter what we do, this will happen actually differently. But here's something you can bring today. Okay, in other words, that CMake command, which means you have that CMake install. But what that does is, if you have a modern enough operating system, and you have enough write permissions, and everything else is right, it will create for directories under it will create a boost directory, and for the subdirectories under that, it will create directories for the actual references to files. Uh, it will create um, symlinks. If it, you, for some reason, do not cannot create symlinks, uh, I I create on Windows. I did fine on my laptop or desktop machine, this machine, uh, I had to have administrative permission. And I ended up running it. I, I, I guess the ability to create a symlink requires a higher permission than I have my user set on this machine. But the script, the CMake script, which, which, which Daniel did, well, it's, it's neat because it, it tries to do some dummy symlink. And if it fails, then so it's such this machine, something's, something's not right. And then it creates four true forwarding headers. For yeah, you actually create forwarding headers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So anyway, on my machine, that took two minutes. It tends to be fairly, even though it's not the fastest uh, machine, it, it does have a fast, fast hard drive on it. Five minutes to four. Right. And what time am I supposed to finish? Four. Okay. Let's skip all this stuff. <laughs> I, I, what I can do, and I, and you want to see me, I've got Tortoise Git, so we can, and I, all this stuff, I run it. You know, I downloaded it, I tested it. The key thing, um, I, I'll just, I will, I'll, you know, the right. so, so, you know, so let, me, let me just go ahead and get out of here. And go to my web browser and boost uh, test result. This uh, this is running my tool that I use to test file system. Okay, this is a real run. If you look at the timing, that was around lunchtime today on this machine. Okay, the only thing that had been done to it is those command to four commands I just showed you. Okay, and then I ran my, I didn't touch it, it has not been all, no, not a single bit anywhere in my infrastructure has been touched, and there you go, it ran, I got two compilers on this baby, and it, there they are. And that, that's, and it's all works, so everything's working. I've also run just, you know, Beat Jam, I built, I've done the getting started in Boost, I've done, I've done, you know, and this is our first test. This is before we even look, you know, it's, this stuff work, works, it preser preserves our infrastructure. We can if we want to, and I'm not suggesting we want to do this. I won't really answer for that until I hear Dave's presentation tomorrow. But if we want to, we can at this point just convert to Git in this modularization structure, and with the hip you know, what's some work from John to get the history, and then run our current infrastructure. I can build a release from this that is, is essentially identical to, you know, and I'm not saying, I'm not saying we want to do that, but we can. We, we, are, we, we are meeting those requirements that I can say for today. Oh, I, I, think, I think we want to, but there's one. We do have to deal with this history question, and and uh, I will, since this is the talk about Git, I wish we had a little bit more time. But um, I th I really think that we ought to have the discussion about what the options are for dealing with with history, um, because uh, because there are several ways to deal with it. Um, 
we have a we have a half hour break, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'd like it if people could stick around so we can have that discussion. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have to take a bio break and then we can talk. Okay. Well, so um, <clears throat> so there are so uh, let me let me try to explain where we're at right now. Um, <clears throat> Okay, uh, and there's an eraser somewhere? Yes. No, that's a post-it note pad. <laughs> yeah, there, somebody, Stephen, could you throw it away? <laughs> ah! <laughs> My teachers used to do that. I mean, we can move this up, too. Okay. Yeah. I'm so, like, while you're doing that, getting started out. <laughs> so, um, if you look at our subversion repository, the, you know, subversion uses directories for branches. So we have something like this at the top. Um, we have, uh, this is the sandbox under which there's a mess, um, which has mostly been deciphered, I think. Um, we have, uh, we have trunk, we have uh, branches and there's website, right? And tags. Oh, and tags, right. But branches and tags are essentially the same thing, both in subverting and in Git, um, as far as this is all this is all concerned. Okay, so there's so this is an image of, <coughs> of our directory tree. Branches has a bunch of different subdirectories under it, and I don't know whether they have sub-subdirectories before they also have some new copies of the boost tree. Okay, so some of, them, some of them have these things. So every triangle is, is a boost tree. Yeah, it's a different version of the boost tree. But okay. Um, so there's your... There's your subversion repository. Okay. Um, the standard tools for converting subversion repositories to Git don't do a really adequate job with some of the things that we've got going on there. That's, that's accurate, right? Yes. Okay. So, uh, so John has been working on a tool to do conversions, and he had a plan, which is, which is a good plan if it can be realized, but it's a little bit elaborate, and I'm actually, in the end, I'm not sure whether, whether we want to invest in that or whether we want to do something simple. And so that's what I want to talk about. Um, so what we have in, in Git now, um, so the deal with the module, first of all, the deal with the modularized repositories that BIMU has been dealing with is that they don't have a record of, of history. They have a, a record of some recent history, but basically, you know, before we were modularizing, they didn't, they weren't recording commits. Okay, so they they started with somebody dumping the state, some current state of boost of some part of boost mm -hmm. into each module. Yeah, okay. and now they just update the snapshots, mm -hmm. but each snapshot may represent one or more commits. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> um, okay. So, uh, so that's inadequate, right? So we need at least some. Somewhere we need some representation of the real history. All right. <clears throat> so what John's tool has done is made essentially first a Git repo that is just like this. This is called the flat history. All right. So this is either SVN or flat history, and that means it's got no actual Git branches in it. Because Git doesn't use subdirectories to do branches. Git has a first class notion of, of what a branch is. Okay, so it's an exact image of like the SVN file system as it has evolved through time. Okay, so there's the flat history. Then this happens to be in the same repo, but it wouldn't have to be. He's also got um, the, the uh, monolithic, what I call the monolithic Git. Okay, uh, so monolithic 
think Git has the structure of a single boost tree, but with all of the tags and, and branches represented as real Git tags and branches. Mm -hmm. okay. Including deleted branches. Right. Including things that have been... Oh yeah, what do you synthesize a name for them? Yeah, I, I say branch and then underbar and then the revision that it disappeared at. Just so that okay. it, it still lives. Okay, so so he's even got that part. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so so this is still monolithic and not modularized. Mm -hmm. Right? And you know, the modularization script takes some some section of you know, for each repository, right. takes some section of this and, and transplants it. Okay. Um, so then, so then the question is, how, in what way do we want to preserve history? All right, there are two options, mm -hmm. and what John has been working on is something that essentially, um, if suppose history is in the z-axis. All right, so history, uh, <laughs> history, time. Uh, so this is ancient history. This is today. Okay. Um, sorry? Time flows backwards. Uh, well, it only yeah. seems that way. The link's <laughs> doing good, at least. <laughs> That's right. Um, so, so, what John has been working on is let's identify the files that are part of, uh, for each library, for library mm -hmm. acts. Let's identify the part of this tree that belongs to X. Mm -hmm. And let's follow that through history, including all the places it, it has moved in each and, branch. And, and, it, and in every branch, yeah, it's history yeah. and everywhere. And in each branch, and now all the places where it has been moved in that branch, so if you renamed a file or, or moved it to a different directory or whatever. So try to catch all of that and put that into, so this is library X, and so we put this into X modularized. This is where we want to end up. And and the um, you know the, the current tip of the master branch of this thing should look just like the current tip of the master branch of our current modularized repos. Right. So okay. question. <laughs> so this is X. <laughs> Uh, all right, uh, there's another option, but you want to ask your question. Yeah, so if you go through this process, and there is a commit back in SVN, which commits stuff to two different libraries on the, in the same commit, okay? Of which there are. Oh, sure there are. Yeah. Maybe even more often than not, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of them. Yeah. Okay, and you go, when you go to this modularized thing, modularized, and you're looking at the history, can you tell that, Commit, you know, revision, SHA string in in yes. X and revision SHA string in Y. Those were the same commit originally. Those yeah. came in at the yes. same. So time. the conversion process puts the subversion commit <coughs> number in each commit mes in okay. message for. So that is, there are a number of ways we can make sure that that's cross reference. Okay. So you can find out. Right. Okay. I'm I'm not sure how important that is. I just right. wanted to know how it could be done. Okay. So, yes. <laughs> but, but actually doing this job of getting, getting from here to here is non-trivial. And John wrote a whole bunch of uh, C++ code that, that you know, manipulates Git in the fastest way possible, but you know, requires two meg of RAM disk, two gig of RAM disk? It, you need six gig RAM disk. Oh, six gig. Yeah, and it's a 10 gig SVN dump file it works from, and it takes 20 minutes to run. So, so it's... It's a major process, and the result isn't right yet, as far as I can tell. The two on the left are, I would say, 100% complete now. The These one on the are, right yeah. is about 80%. These two are right. I, we don't know why. We don't know why this part isn't running. Okay. Okay. So somebody, somebody could invest in, in getting that right, and, and that would be wonderful to have. Okay. But there's, there is another alternative. So, <clears throat> one, an, a different way to look at it is that this, this actually has a, an accurate view of history. The fact that those 
that those commits across multiple libraries are one commit is it's, part of history. It's reflected in that, right? right? Because it's all one repo. Right. So, so you can deal with this in another way. Um, so, I'm going to give. I'm going to. I'm going to illustrate that other way in two steps. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the first step for for thinking about it is let's clone monolithic for each project. So we make a clone of this repository with all of the history, mm -hmm. and then the and then the next commit is delete the, most of it. Yeah. Delete most of it and reorganize. And also only cloning the, the main branch, not all the other branches, right? No. Then, you're gonna you're gonna oh you're no no, no this is just start. a first step. Don't worry. Yeah. Okay, this is just a first step. So anyway, so yeah, and then you delete all the other stuff and all the other branches, and now you have a modularized repository. Okay, and that means that that all of the different modularized repositories actually share a common history, mm -hmm. and the the shards of all of those commits will be identical, and they'll you know everything's good. Okay, the only problem with that is that every single individual repository, even for tiny little libraries, has got to carry all of Boots history. Right. Okay. So <clears throat> there's a way to deal with that, and it's something called grafts. And so Git has a feature called grafts that essentially lets you take, there's some, some bit of history here, and you say, OK, this root commit here, its parents are actually this other thing from this other repository. So you can pull in, you could pull in Git's history at any time that you wanted it, graft it onto the beginning of your history, and, and, then, uh, and then you would have a complete accurate look at history, but you wouldn't have to carry that around. All right, and that's probably a lot easier to get to than, than this thing, or it's yeah. probably easier anyway to get to. It's way easier, and also that thing is never going to be truly correct. Right. It's always going to have to have some level of heuristics going on that somebody might disagree with. So the question is really, how, how much do, do, do people really care about seeing their own individual's library slice of history? And is that something that they want to look at a lot? Or are they happy to know that their history is really comes from you know, this, this thing? I would prefer to go with the graphs for the sake of simplicity and ease of use, but if people are going to be upset that their history isn't in their default clone, that's another issue. Mm -hmm. you well, say? I actually think I prefer that just because it preserves the history the way it originally was. Yes. Yeah. yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, you mean you prefer the graphs solution? Yeah. yeah. Not and the, the main and, and, you, and you can still access it if you, if you need to, but generally I find I only look way back in history once in a while. Right. Yeah. Right. So, um, one of the things that influences me is that having been through innumerable conversions, probably more than anybody here else has, things you worry about um, so much recede quickly into the past. And, and so, um, yeah, we, we want to do a good job, but the, 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 it's not very long before you're at a stage where that past history will almost never be important to you. Will never be important to you. Well, or it may be very, for, say, a legal question. It may suddenly become important, but it isn't important that um, it's as easy to retrieve as the history of the last six months commits, mm -hmm. which is obviously you want that to be silky smooth. So it's not going to bother me if old, if a lot of stuff you have to go. I mean, we're not going to, we're not blowing this away. Okay. No, nor were nor are we no, mark this away, which is just another representation okay. for this. Just another representation for that. that if push comes to shove an, an old history, I can always go and look at some of this stuff. Cert, there are things here that I don't see any need at all that and that 
even from the get-go. Well, part of the reason to keep some of Sandbox is that some of these libraries were developed here and then moved into Well, groups. yeah, some, but most of yeah. Sand, and I'm not saying we don't, we, you want to throw away permanently, but just, there are ways you can, there's, there's a no big need to throw it out. There's a huge, you're never going to throw it out. And, and, and it, that uh, if the, the main line, what's trunk now in probably the release branches, that works pretty well, pretty well. It will soon be, be in the, far enough into the future that that pretty well will have receded into the past. And okay, so here's, some, here's my proposal. Uh, do, do you want to say something? I was just going to say that we should also bear in mind that this is what Dave's describing with the graphs. This is what the Linux project does now. And they did a nifty trick that in their case where they have their um, their truncated history, where you can graft on the full history, the originating, the original commit, the last one you'll see if you do git log, is a description of how to graft onto the main history. That's cute. Yeah. That's really cute. Um, so, so here's here's my proposal for for achieving this this graph situation. Um, it, it's quite possible. I just came up with this, so it's quite possible there's something wrong with it. Please shoot at it. Um, okay, so there are basically we, we're starting sort of fresh, right? We're going to keep this, but everybody's everybody's going to start with a fresh thing over here. Now the question is, which branches are active? Which branches and text do, do people want to see in this repository? Because you probably don't care about most of them. Most of you know, a lot of times you made a branch and you did something with it and. Maybe it just hung around in the repository. I, at least that's true for my libraries. I, I have almost mm -hmm. no active branches. It's mostly trunk and release. Mm -hmm. So we identify what those are. For most, for most people, it's trunk and release. All right. So we we say you know we send out a message say we're doing the modularization. Any things that you want to appear in your new module, um, uh, you know, let us know what those are, because otherwise you'll get trunk and release. Okay. And all right. So then, what we do is we take we take uh, the monolithic history here, and uh, for we for each of those branches, we prefix it with the library name, and and make a branch where these. So let's say let's say for library foo. So there'll be a branch for foo release and a branch for foo uh, uh, trunk. Right. Okay. So, so now this is not history anymore. This is branches. Okay. These are different different branches, and I'm just going to show two. Here. Okay. So we have we have release and trunk. So rel. Sure. Okay. So each of these will get a branch prefixed by each library. All right. So they'll be uh, we'll branch to food trunk, and we'll branch to bar trunk, and the same for release. Right. Okay. And we'll branch these things from the corresponding large. Then in these branches, we'll do the modularization process, which is, you know, delete the files that don't belong and reorganize this as we currently have. Okay, and that's the end of that's the end of the monolithic repository. Then we seal the monolithic repository, and and that's we use that to preserve history. So now, over here in library foo, you know that you graph. If you want to get history of whatever branch you graph. Uh, you know, onto you graft your trunk branch onto food trunk, and you brick graft your bar branch on the. Uh, hey, sorry, go ahead. Um, that branch. would seem to have the, the problems you alluded to earlier, where the modularization library, well, uh, modular, modularized repo would still contain all the history because you branched and then pared it down. Am I misunderstanding? No, you're you are misunderstanding. Okay. Sorry. Um, we're gonna basically the, 
this repo will start as a snapshot of the tip state of each of these okay. branches. And then you okay. you graph to back to the main one to get your history. Right. Okay. What? That's okay. what I thought you wanted. I just didn't right. think that was what, what you described. What happens if uh, two months into the after you do this, a developer comes and says, "Oh, I needed, I didn't need just trunk in the leads. I also need some other brand." We can get it for them. You they they it. haven't done any development on it, right? Because because SVN is sealed and history is sealed, so yeah. they may have made a new branch in their thing, and then they can craft that themselves. But yeah. In fact, well, yeah. All we would need to do is, you know, we'd update, we'd update history with a, another one of these, you know, we, so they had just identified a third branch that they want, right, over yeah, here. Yeah. So whatever uh, yeah. the branch Q, and for you. you do the same thing for their library in branch Q. Right, I guess it's just one library. So they're, they're the author of Foo, so you'd end up with Foo Q, and then they could go off and, and graft it into their own repository for whatever purpose they want. We give them a snapshot. Or let them get their own snapshot. I have a question yeah. that is not really related to the history, uh, yeah. but how do you want to work with the modularized uh, world if you want to make modifications in separate modules? Uh, that may be may be well, dependent on each other. They may be dependent on each other. Yeah. Well, so, so would you do, let's have an example. A, would you make a, a clone? Well, let's give you an example modification that you need to make across two libraries. Uh, um, I wouldn't know, but... Well, because I think how you deal with this will depend on, on what kind of modification it is. Yeah, but you always have some library that is dependent of some other, and it's not compatible with version X. Yeah. Right. Well, one of the things that we're gonna that I'm gonna be proposing in the Ripple talk is, right. and Robert Remy has been talking about this for years, is yeah. you do your development against released versions of other libraries. So whatever library you're working on, you're working on against a released version of uh, the other library. It might be a pre-released version that somebody has tagged, but there there's a definite version number for that. And so the way the way this will work is, you know, you get library one. There, there's got to be there can't be a dependency cycle, right? So library one makes its change, publishes its thing, and then library two set, depends on that version and and makes its change. Yeah. The key thing is you're not just pointing to the library; you're pointing to a specific yeah. you know, version. All right. But let's get back to let's just get back to history for a minute. I just want to know, are, like, do we have consensus on this approach? Is, do you think there's anything wrong with this approach? No, I think it's a great approach, and I think it also has enough precedent in real projects that we're not quite as strong. I guess there's one thing that we should do different, right? This should be a splash and not a dash. You know, I'm going to talk to you offline. We don't need to do that step. I don't think we do. I think we want to do that step. Just to have the... We're, we're running it. long. Yeah, to, so that the, that the, the change is more coherent when people look, when people graft it together. What, what I want people to see is a uh, simple movement and not, not like the whole world just blew up. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, then I would call it module slash foo slash trial. Yeah, yeah exactly. That's why, I'm, that's why I said slash. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, okay. I mean, the, yeah, right. we, want I mean, we, we want a reasonable history, not, a, not some yeah. something that in you. And also, it would be fabricated. That's the whole thing about the modularized history. Is yeah. It's really a fabricated yeah. history. Yeah. And it never existed. Okay, good. Well, then we can do this, and we can get it done shortly. Yeah.